All right. Uh, Hi. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we are back after a short break. Uh, so the next speaker is Jason Arkhams, uh, also known as Jaraka. Uh, Jason is a contributor to many Python libraries, including Setup Tools, CherryPy, Path, and much more. Uh, he's also uh, a great speaker with multiple presentations on his account. And today he will talk about exploration of shells, environments, and packages. Uh, I just wanted to remind everybody that if you have any questions, you can post them whenever you like on the either YouTube comments or on the Slack channel or on Facebook comments, and we'll ask the questions at the end of the presentation. And now I'm leaving you all with Jason. Great. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Uh, great presentation, Christian. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so I'm Jason. Um, Jericho online, also Jericho or Haruko, however you want to say it is fine. Um, I, I'm currently SRM, uh, Site Reliability Manager at Google uh, in Pittsburgh. So I work with the ML Serving Group where we do inference as a service. So um, machine learning uh, at scale globally, including the auto, L, auto ML services you might find in, in GCP. Uh, but my passion for the past 20 years has been Python. I learned Python uh, as part of a compiler's course and fell in love with the language and have been using it everywhere I can ever since. So I maintain, as, as Kuba said, many packages on PyPI, uh, including setup tools, CherryPy, Path, IRC, and as well a core developer on CPython. So I've I've been contributing there to the zip file path and import lib uh, libraries, among other things. So that's most about me. Um, but what I want to talk about today, and, and basically I, I don't have a formal presentation prepared. I don't have a lot of slides. But what I want to do is walk through some of the tools and experiences that I enjoy the most uh, recently that I think maybe haven't gotten as much attention or acclaim as, as they deserve. Uh, so I'm going to start first with shells, uh, basically conch shell, and and how I got to that, and how it works for me, and and some of the interesting, and perhaps challenging aspects of it. I'll then go into my second bit, which is about pip run and pipx, and tools around managing uh, command lines or temporary environments. I'll get into that, and then the last segment is just an update about packaging news, uh, things you may or may not have read about or learned about just to raise awareness about them and to open up the forum for questions. So I'm very eager to take questions and, and answer them. So feel free to send as many as you like. With that, I will go on to the next segment, which is shells and conch. So conch shell came to me, uh, well, I discovered it at one of the PyCons when I was I was musing about Bash and and how interesting would it be if our shells were um, could be unified, right? I, I have the Bash shell, and every time I go to use it, uh, I have to learn the syntax for a for loop, and and, I, and I'm never quite sure about it. You know, I know Python inside and out. I use it every day. I know how to get to sub processes and databases and everything else. And in Bash, I'm really, you know, I've got a, a one year's worth of experience maybe, right? You know, a little bit of experience, just enough to, to do something incorrectly. Um, not to mention, uh, I don't have access to a lot of the powerful things you get in Python, like being able to combine lists of, of, of items uh, or iter tools, you know, using the iter tools for looping over things. So, so I was thinking about just using Python as my shell because Python, of course, comes with an interactive shell. And but here, you know, invoking processes and interacting with processes isn't, isn't the most convenient thing. First of all, you have to uh, make you know import some sub process library, and then you want to execute a command. You have to you know exquisitely in, in, invoke it, right? Uh, so if I wanted to, you know, cat foo, you know, I can do that. Uh, well, assuming I do it correctly. 
me try. So right, get get the syntax right. Uh, cat is not a command apparently, or no, foo is not a. There we go. Um, what is a file? So I'm, I I could cat this file because I know it exists. Okay, great. So I, I could use the Python shell, but um, it's it's not the most elegant thing. And so when I learned about conch, which is a bash-like shell uh, built in Python, I thought, wow, that sounds really great. So here is the homepage. It's conch.sh. Uh, I'm sorry, let me say it again. It's con.sh, xon.sh. And uh, so here's where you can see the video. You can try it out. You can learn about it. And, and they give, you know, give some nice demos here of how it works. So you get lots of really great features. and um, But most of the things you're familiar with. So simple execution of commands, easy creation of aliases through syntax that you're familiar with, right? Uh, li you know, list assignments uh, and whatnot. Access to for loops, you know, multi-line input, right? So you're not constantly fighting with escapes and things. You you know them because you've used Python. Um, so yeah, I I I've been using this as my main shell, not just on macOS, which is where I am now, but also on Windows and Linux. So I that's another big advantage of of Conch is that it supports Windows, so you can use this uh, pretty much cross-platform. Um, yeah, and so next thing I want to go into is basically walk through my Conch RC. So you may be familiar with, in, in Bash, you have the profile, right? And um, and I still have a Bash profile around, and I might look at that in a second, but you'll notice that Conch has this auto-completion built in. I, I never had to enable this, it just came built in. So I'm really pleased with that and I enjoy using it. But this is my uh, my profile script. So th this demonstrates a lot of the things that I get advantage from. So one of the things you'll notice right away is it's basically Python. Uh, you can import anything that's available in the environment where Conch is installed. Uh, you can do your try try and accept right for things that may not be around. So here's a, here's a dependency that it's available in some cases, but not in others. Uh, you know, path manipulation, really simple, right? So I want to make sure tilde local bin is on my path. Well, here, here we can just do it. Append uh, tilde local bin and then invoke expand user on it uh, because that's uh, that that expands the tilde here to my home directory. Uh, you know, there's some some things that I do that are platform specific. Uh, here, here's where I actually use the source bash. So assuming that this file is available, and you'll notice I keep this, my, my bash profile, I keep that in Dropbox. Um, but here, I just source it, and that file gets parsed out, all of the aliases that were created there, the environment variables, everything else. So I still kind of have one foot in bash, right? Um, and, and that, but to be honest, I haven't used bash in a serious way uh, in, in a couple of years. Conch is mature and ready to go and, and really does a lot of great things. Although I'll get into some of the some of the limitations and issues in a bit, or at least the issues that affect me. Uh, here's here's a creation of aliases, right? So uh, I created an alias for Mercurial. I hardly ever use it, but there it is. Uh, I set this thing up so that I can create per environment or per host uh, settings and just load those using your the familiar glob right in python you know glob so you can just use glob and then source those files uh, i i use keyring extensively that's one of the libraries i maintain but i use that for storing all my secrets which is why i'm not afraid to show you my profile directory here uh, it's all of the secrets are stored securely in the mac os keychain uh, or if i were to move to windows it would be in be in windows credential manager um, and none of the code here would have to change. So I'll keep scrolling down. Here's a, a code I use a lot, you know, for pushing a new branch in Git, and I've just aliased it to something else. There's probably a way to do that in Git itself, but I prefer the conch alias. So that's the alias I use. Um, I create a few more aliases for other Git operations. Here's something where I grab uh, keys, one-time passwords, and I use uh, some some routines here to basically add my multi-factor authentication 
for a whole bunch of different services. So here's a whole bunch of services that that I use. All the secrets are hidden away. So um, it's not going to help you to to read those there. But um, so so this is conch, right? This is you can define functions. They become uh, they be they become aliases, they become commands in your command environment. And you'll notice there's this mixing of Python syntax uh, and you know execution, right? So here I'm taking uh, a sub process, get remote, getting the output of that, stripping off any uh, any white space and then and then returning a value. Uh, that's one example. That's really Python oriented, but you'll see there there are probably some others in here. Let me find one. Um, so he, here's here's one where I'm generating a, a token for for PyPI, and here uh, uh, the crypt password. I I resolve using echo with a pipe to a Travis command, you know, where the input to the Travis command is the output of a Python. Uh, Python bit. And so you'll notice the syntax here is probably pretty familiar, right? Uh, with the dollar open parenthesis and then a command, right? That that runs a, a subprocess and puts the output in, in the in the value of that execution. The at symbol is similar, except this is for a Python. It, it's in the Python space. So this says run the function or evaluate this expression, get repo URL function, you know, execute it. And whatever it outputs becomes the value of this expression. So you're able to just uh, intersperse things that you know about Python and things that you would do in Bash and just use them pretty naturally. And Conch has this heuristic, uh, and it's it's not perfect. I think once or twice in the past three three years or so, I've I've encountered a situation where Conch didn't do what I expect, but but 99% of the time, if not more, it does exactly what I would expect. And when it doesn't, there's a way to, to adapt that. So, so yeah, that's Conch. That's what I love about it. Um, looking forward to your feedback on that. From there, oh, I wanted to talk about issues, right? So there are two issues uh, that affect me the most. Uh, the first is the standard error and standard out interleaving. Um, so, you know, I can do, I, I can run commands pretty normally, but I think we noticed when I ran Python earlier and, and I did something that produced some output, um, everything looks okay usually, but sometimes I'll find that this standard error here will appear before the standard out. And it turns out there's a really challenging um, race condition that uh, Conch does its best to try to output these two basically parallel streams in the order that they arrive, but due largely to the speed of Python being not quite as fast as C and other challenges with concurrency, sometimes these two streams will get interleaved. And there are ways to work around it. There are commands that you can use to disable that functionality. Um, it, Disabling the functionality, you lose some of the more advanced features of Conch, which uh, I'm not going to get into, but features around uh, command reuse or, or a history that keeps track of output that happened and can tell you whether the output has changed over time. And, and Conch does a lot of management around those, and you lose those features if you disable the um, the, the feature that, that interleaves the, the input and output. The other issue I've encountered is the way that um, these expressions are evaluated uh, the bash expression. So if I were to say, um, is it, so I can say echo foo, right? And I can say X equals that value. But if I look at X, you'll notice that it has a new line in it. Um, that is different from the behavior in bash. And because it's different, you have to account for that when you're, when you're using these, uh, these expressions. And so, that's there is an actual open issue on it, and the the conch project is trying to figure out how to possibly be more bash like in that sense. Um, there there is an easy workaround, which is this uh, this symbol. Um, did I not get that right? 
what did I do wrong there? Okay, I don't know what I did wrong. <laughs> I know you can do, well, so you can do dot strip, which we've done before, and that will produce it without the new line. Um, and in a lot of expressions, you can do the at dollar sign, although that's not working here. So uh, th yeah, there are some workarounds that work in certain cases, but that ends up being a little bit confusing. So those are the two issues that have nagged me a little bit, but for the most part, I really love conch and I, I use it every day. I use it on on my Raspberry Pi and I use it on my, my workstation at work, in my Linux workstation. I use it when I go into Windows um, because then I get to use my same profile scripts and, my, and, this, and get the same environment no matter which operating system I'm on. So that was conch. Next up, I want to talk about pip run and pipx. So pip run actually was something that I came to when I was trying to, uh, so I helped maintain setup tools. And one of the challenges with setup tools is build requirements. The setup requires uh, that they use. And there are some really interesting bootstrap challenges with setup requires, right? If you're importing setup tools, but then your setup requires imports a different version of setup tools, how do you, you know, resolve that? Um, there are challenges around where do you store these build requirements while you're building them and everything else. Um, so as I was exploring that problem, I came up with pip run, which is, intended to basically replace this case where you, you want to create an environment, you want to install dependencies into it, but you don't necessarily need to keep those around. You're not creating an environment for persistence sake, you're creating it temporarily, maybe to do a build. Uh, that was the original use case, but there are actually lots of reasons you might want to use pip run. I'm going to expand my font here for ease of reading. So. So here are some of the reasons uh, I use pip run and I would recommend it. So trials and experiments, uh, build setup, test runners, just in time script running. So you, you need to run a script, but you don't have the dependencies. You want to run those scripts. Uh, interactive development, bug triage. I use this all the time when somebody says such and such a library is not working at this version. I can just quickly get that version. And so, so that's where I use pip run. And here's what it effectively does. It replaces a series of commands, creates a virtual environment. Although it doesn't actually use virtual environment, it, uh, it, it uses just a simple uh, pip install target. Um, installs you know, the, the requirements, the package one, the package two, the requirements, uh, and then runs Python in that environment and then, and then cleans up the environment. So, it, pip run works this way, right? Install the two packages, install the requirements.txt, and then run the command, whatever the command is in that Python environment. So I can give an example of it. The trivial example is just to run pip run by itself. And when you do, you'll notice you end up with a Python shell, right? So pip run installed nothing, and then it invoked Python with no, no command arguments. Um, that's the degenerate use of pip run, not, not all that useful, right? But let's say now I want to run uh, with something like requests. Um, I, I, I can say pip run requests, hit enter, it installs requests. Okay, that's great. And then it shows up the shell. And, and here, we're, here we're seeing that uh, interleaving issue with conch. So uh, I can now import requests where I didn't have it before and voila, it's, it's available and ready for me. A lot of times I will pass dash Q, uh, which because we're passing parameters directly to pip install, uh, dash Q will install quiet. And so what you get is pip run and requests and, and, and straight into your, your function. But let's say, so, so this is great. I can say requests um, less than two, right? And it'll go out and get me, oh, okay, it's not gonna work. Uh, I'm getting lots of errors from pip around no module available. And it's using the new resolver. So it's going to fail as many times as it needs to, to determine that nothing is going to install. Um, and the reason I know, so I, I, I know this error very uh, intimately, no module name setup tools. That's because 
requests has an implicit dependency on setup tools. Uh, and I don't have setup tools in installed. I know a lot of people do, but I've been running without it installed in order to kind of chase down these uh, issues. But I know that use pet 517, use pet 517 will, will allow that to build correctly. And so I should be able to get requests version two and there we have it, right? And, and so then I can pass things, you know, like, so after the double dash, everything before the double dash gets passed to pip install, everything after the double dash gets passed to the Python invocation. So I can use dash C to run a command, right? And it will build that version. You'll notice it happened a little bit faster this time. That's because second time around, uh, Pip had already cached the wheel for requests less than two, so it was able to resolve it quickly, uh, put it somewhere on Python path, run Python with it on the path, and then um, and then do it. In fact, let's take a look at what the path is. Import sys, sys.path, and we can see in the sys.path, there's this temporary directory. This is kind of the Mac, uh, Mac OS syntax for temp. Um, uh, pip run has created a temporary directory. And in this directory, if you were to look, you'd find requests and all of its dependencies. Um, so that's pip run. And that becomes really useful if you want to do things. Uh, I've even been able to use it, for example, to use while debugging JSON pickle. Uh, I would pickle something in one version of JSON pickle, pipe that to pip run on a different version of JSON pickle. Or you can also do it for cross Python versions, right? So. Uh, let's say I have Python 3.6 and I want to use pip run. Um, and I want to use some dependency boto, right? Uh, I can just do that. I'm just going to do dash q to make it quiet. And I'll get a Python 3.6 environment uh, or shell rather with, uh, with boto installed. So that's that's the magic of pip run. Uh, highly recommended. I'm still working on getting that inst in, integrated into pip so that you'll just have it everywhere and you can do a pip space run. Uh, it doesn't exist yet. Something I'm working on. Um, in, so one of the things I do in the pip run here is I compare it, and there are lots of examples, and I highly encourage you to use, you know read through the readme here on pip run. But I also include a comparison with PipX. And PipX is, it, it, it has similar goals of, of creating environments for you and kind of managing them. But the key difference is about persistence. Pip run is meant to be very ephemeral uh, and, and focuses on creating environments, using them once, and then cleaning themselves up. Uh, PipX is more about being persistent. So uh, PipX, focuses on, you, you tell it that you have a, a Python dependency that has a command uh, that supplies a command or a set of commands and you wanna make those available. And I highly recommend it, especially if you have uh, Python based commands that you, you wanna, wanna have. So I have pipx installed and I'm just gonna do a list and see some of the things that I have installed here. So tox is a really, uh, great command for running tests and it's nice to be able to just keep that up to date and and so when i say uh, I'm, I'm actually just going to do pipx uninstall tox and so tox is gone um, and if i try to run tox i don't have it anywhere so this is the conch syntax for command not found um, so i i want i need to get tox I can just pip x install tox. It will create the environment for me. It will manage keeping pip up to date you know, for all of the environments. And it will expose whatever commands that package exposes. And, uh, and then I would probably want to also install, uh, you, you can also inject other things, right? Uh, I use tox pip version quite a bit. I like to have that injected. So I can say inject into my tox environment this other dependency tox pip version. And so now when I run Tox, uh, it will have that plugin available. But it's otherwise very isolated. Uh, let's see, pipx, is it? Yes. Uh, so pipx creates these directories, these VNs uh, for each 
each of the projects. So I have all of these different commands installed. These are all Python commands that are exposed by, by some Python project. So town crier and key ring and fabric. You, anytime I were to say fa fab, um, in fact, which fab should tell me that it's it's in dot local bin, but that's been installed through uh, through these pipx uh, VMs. Um, one of the and pipx will even help you bootstrap uh, it, when you install pipx for the first time. You need to configure your environment to have this path, this bin path on your path, and it will do that through a tool called ensure env. Uh, and I think you can say pipx ensure and no ensure path, right? Yeah, ensure path. And it will across any number of shells, including conch, uh, make sure that the make sure that that's on your path and so you're ready to go. And that works. Uh, it works in PowerShell. It works in Command Exe. It works across a lot of uh, environments. So highly encourage that. So that's pipx. Um, it's a different use case, but uh, I, I use these two interchangeably. I use pipx when I need something uh, persistently, you know, to be around uh, tomorrow, and, and pip run when I just need to test something out and I don't want to worry about creating an environment and deleting it later. Look forward to your questions on that. Uh, so that's the second segment. I'll move on now to the third segment which is packaging updates. So I wrote up some notes here. Um, some of these announcements you may or may not have heard of, but uh, I'll share them here. So PIP 517 and 518 have been around for, I don't know, a couple of years maybe, uh, maybe a little longer than that. Um, these two Python enhancement proposals uh, actually superseded the work that I was doing on, on PIP run for setup requires. In fact, it produces, it's a much better, more sophisticated solution for build isolation and build dependencies. Uh, interestingly, PEP 518 got, got implemented first or, or had more adoption first because it deals mainly with build dependencies. So it, it enables a packaging project to declare its build dependencies that it doesn't have an implicit dependency on setup tools, or maybe it can depend on something uh, other than setup tools to build. And, uh, and, and so it enables arbitrary package builders, right? It enables these things like uh, poetry or flit uh, to, to, to build packages without set of tools. So uh, the, the key things that have been coming out of this is the, the PEP 517 package and also build. Um, and that's build as in pypi.org slash project slash build. It's uh, a build command and I, Highly encourage using this to produce your S disks and wheels if you're uploading to PyPI. So if you haven't heard of that, take a look. Um, you've probably heard of the PIP resolver. Uh, it's now the default in PIP 20.3. I wasn't involved in the implementation of that, but uh, you you saw it today uh, and you've probably seen it around. So just be aware that this, the resolver now is more sophisticated and has solved a, a long, long standing feature that's been uh, desired for PIP. Um, I'm working on a, a merging distutils with setup tools and actually removing from uh, CPython. The deprecation plan, I believe, has been accepted. Uh, I'm not certain of that, so uh, you might want to double check me on it. But there, there's a pep out there to deprecate uh, distutils from CPython, and the solution for doing that is setup tools is going to adopt distutils. The work for adoption is done, but there are some, still some challenges with platforms, uh, NumPy, uh, well, platforms like Debian and Fedora, and packages like NumPy that patch, that monkey patch, distutils. And so if distutils moves from where they expect it to be found, if it moves out of the standard lib, um, then it causes problems. Uh, but where, for the most cases, this can be enabled with, with a, an opt in switch and it provides a version of distributes that works across all supported Python versions, which for setup tools is Python 3.6 and later at this point. Uh, finally, uh, I've been striving over the last um, 
five years, I don't know, as long as I can to, to find a way to discon de decouple package resources and set of tools. Um, and decoupling turned out to be kind of intractable or at least very difficult. So instead, uh, I've just discouraged use of it by creating some replacements. So for accessing metadata about a package, uh, I created import lib metadata and um, that relies on this other package, which uh, was fun and interesting, zipfile.path, which is a new way of traversing zip files as if they were pathlib objects. Uh, so if you've used pathlib.path in order to, to glob or ls, you know, or to, to iterdir, right? You can now do iterdir on a zip file. And uh, there's a entry in my blog. My blog is at no surprise, blog.chiraco.com. It's it was um, maybe six months ago or so. I gave an example of using the zip file.path to traverse a zip file from a cloud object. Uh, it was actually in Google Cloud, and it was a very large file. And I didn't want to download the gigabytes of file in order to open it. I was able to use this to kind of traverse it and explore it uh, without consuming the whole thing. So I could do it over an HTTP connection. Finally, import lib resources. I've contributed a lot to, I've worked closely with Brett Cannon and Barry Warsaw on providing access to resources and packages. Um, so non-module objects, right? Things that aren't Python, but it's your data files, it's your uh, command scripts, whatever that might be included with the package. Uh, import lib resources provides access to that and solves a lot of the hard problems of uh, does this work if it's in a zip wheel? Uh, does this work if, if the package is exposed through some other import mechanism, like through a database or over a network connection? Um, it, it provides the abstractions and in the interfaces to make that happen. So import lib metadata was new with Python 3.8. Resources was do, new with Python 3.7, but it's been uh, improved quite a bit in Python 3.9. Uh, but these back, back ports, import lib metadata, resources, and zip, these, these provide back ports for older versions of Python as well. So the functionality is available uh, going back to Python 2.7. So those are my updates on packaging. And I'm happy now to take any questions about any of those segments. Can you okay all right uh, thanks a lot for the presentation and i just wanted to remind about the virtual app pause in the comments and the reactions and on slack and everywhere and so far we have one question so feel just make sure that if you want to ask any questions to to jason just leave them on any of the channels so the first question from S. Vitovsky, what about pipx run as an alternative for the pip run? It can also be used to create ephemeral virtual environments. That's a great question. And um, I, I do recall exploring that. And let me see if, uh, if I captured that in, in my evaluation. Right. So, so pip, pip x run it does support ephemeral environments, and it's great for uh, Python Python packages that expose command line console scripts. Uh, so, if you're if what you're after is like talks, which exposes exposes a console script called talks. Um, pipx run is great for that and you can use it. I would encourage using it for that. If on the other hand, what you're looking for is something that's in a runpy script. And so that would be like Python dash M talks. So talks exposes both and you could use talks with either uh, pip run or pip pipx run. Um, there are other tools that don't expose uh, console scripts but have ex executable functionality. Uh, one of those is the PEP 517 project. So let me quickly show you pip run PEP 517. So here's running uh, the, the PEP 517 build, and I'm just going to do a dash dash help. 
and I'm going to run it with dash Q so we don't see the install. And you'll see we've actually executed the PEP 517 build module. It's a RunPy module, or, or this might actually be a package. I'm not sure, uh, but but it's exposed through the Python dash M process, and we've executed it here. PipX can't do this, but pip run can. So that's the, the main difference. Could you repeat the question? Uh, yes, definitely. I use it at work. Um, I, I probably, so I'm cautious about it giving conch um, to, you know, scripts to others, right? So it, it doesn't have widespread adoption. And I would be, you know, hesitant to say, use a conch script to give to a colleague unless you know they run conch. Uh, so it is still in that kind of early phase of adoption where you, you probably should be prepared to give them a bash script or a Python script. Uh, but as far as my workstation, my main environment, I use conch because of the advantages that it, that it provides and the flexibility that I have. So I will use things like, um, I, I do this all the time at work, I'll say, uh, servers equals uh, server one, server two, split. And then I will say, uh, so I, I wanna do something with servers and I would do the operation, right? The operations are op one and op two and split that. And then I will say for server comma ops in iter tools dot product servers ops um you know do op comma server right or, or server dot op you know however it works right um well i guess it would be like do server comma op something like that right and what that will do is you know for server one uh it will do op one then for server two it'll do op one then for server uh, one, it'll do op two, and then for server two, it'll do op, op one and two, right? Uh, gives you the cross product, but in this really simple way, you've you've said, and and you know, there are many times we'll have like a third and fourth factor that I will add to the iter tools, and so it'll it'll run over a, a combination of all the things, and um, as you can see, I was able to type that up in a matter of seconds. Uh... We had a little bit of technical difficulty that my that the question was not heard on the streaming. So I just wanted to mention that the question was whether Xange is mature enough to use it at work. In the meantime, we got uh, thanks for the um, sorry thanks for the answer. Great talk from um, Svitovsky. and another question from yeah another question from Greenblade. Any thoughts about making PEP five one seven isolated builds default? Uh, I'm, I'm in favor of that. I, I don't think there's a lot of resistance to it. So it's mainly a matter of, you know, what is it going to break, right? There's, there's fear of the unknown, um, especially in this world where we, we don't have a lot of metrics about who's using what and, and what the impact would be of, of setting that default. Um, but we're definitely moving in that direction and, so the way that you can help with that is to is to use pep 517 by default. In fact, you can do that by setting pep uh, pip pep 517. Uh, what is it? Use equals one, right? If you set that in your environment, you will use pep 517 by default. If you run into any problems, uh, let the pip team know. And if you don't run into any problems, then that will be one fewer uh, use case that we will be worried about. Um, otherwise, I would say uh, go to go to the PIP uh, bug tracker. I'm pretty sure there's a a bug, if not a, a more advanced discussion about what it's going to take to make that default. All right, thank you. In the meantime, Sunrise Sun uh, mentioned uh, that it was an excellent example, and thanks a lot. I believe My we point. have.
one more minute for any questions. So if you want to ask about anything, that's the best time. And while waiting for those questions, I just wanted to remind you all that we have a competition with two PyCharm licenses to win. You only need to make a photo of how you're watching the PyConic streaming and post that either on Facebook with a PyConic mention or on the Slack general channel. All right. Just checking if any questions are arriving, but wait a second. All right, I believe that that would be it. So once again, thanks Jason for the for the excellent talk. And I remind just wanted to remind that we can leave a virtual applause for that so that uh, Jason would be able to take a look at that. And we have one more question, just just in time. So a question from Pavel. What what if I work with many remote servers? Do I need to install Xange on every of them? Uh, yes, you do. Um, however, I, I recently learned of a tool that that's that's built. It's designed to automate just that problem um, of you, you install it on your local workstation and your remote servers. You can basically push conch environments to uh, dynamically. I, I unfortunately can't recall that off the top of my head, so I'll have to look it up, but I will send it through the group. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, and I believe that's, that's it for today. So thank you, uh, Jason. And we'll be back with you with the summary of the meeting in two minutes. Fantastic.